All right, let's get started. We were talking on Friday about heat exchangers. And we first went through some common simplifications um, for our uh, total thermal resistance expression. So we wrote down what the expressions would look like if there was no fouling, if we neglected conduction resistance through the inner tube wall, and then if we did both of those things. Um, and then wrote down that it's a common simplification to neglect both fouling and conduction resistance and what the nomenclature that the book typically uses if you make those assumptions. And then we said for the area, it's important to note that um, for both the convection terms, the convection resistance terms, because you're looking at the convection resistance right here for the inner fluid and right here for the outer fluid, the appropriate diameter is the inner diameter in both of those cases. And then we talked through, started talking through heat exchanger analysis um, and then went through kind of two different ways to calculate the heat transfer rate out of the hot fluid and into the cold fluid. And so the first way was using the steady flow thermal energy equation. And we said that for an idealized heat exchanger, given the assumptions that we're considering, the heat transfer rate out of the cold, out of the hot fluid and into the cold fluid would be equal. And you can calculate it using either the values for the hot or the cold fluid. And so these two um, Q values should be the same, assuming all of our assumptions are true. And then we said you can also use the expression for um, this kind of uh, composite cylinder equation where we have instead of this total T1 minus T2 expression on top, we have the um, log mean temperature difference, which is relevant because the um, temperature of the fluids are, are changing in X. And then we have the total thermal, thermal resistance on the bottom. And then we said the expression for the, to for the log mean temperature difference um, is equal to this right here, the delta T2 minus one over log of delta T2 minus one. Um, and the specific expressions for delta T1 and two depend on if you're talking about a parallel flow or a counter flow exchanger. And then we talked about parallel flow and described um, parallel flow heat exchangers and then just started talking about counter flow heat exchangers. So this is where we'll pick back up today. So for parallel flow, we said the um, hot and cold fluids enter at the same end and flow in the same direction, but for counter flow, they enter at opposite ends and flow in opposite directions. So this is the kind of temperature as a function of X qualitative diagram for a counter flow um, heat exchanger. And so you have the inlet of the hot fluid is exchanging heat with the outlet of the cold fluid and then vice versa on the other end. So you have delta T1 now is THI minus TCO as opposed to the parallel case where it was THI minus TCI. And then delta T2, of course, is the hot outlet minus the cold inlet. And then this delta T um, across the entire heat exchanger is a little more uniform than it is in a parallel flow case where you have this huge temperature difference at the inlet and then it um, gets smaller and smaller as the temperatures kind of start to approximate each other. Okay, so that's kind of our picture for the counter flow case. And then we'll just pick back up and write down a couple of more observations about counter flow configurations. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, so one result of the counterflow configuration, as we mentioned, is delta T is more even across the entire heat exchanger. So typically, the heat transfer rate changes less with X. So it's a little more uniform across the entire length. 
And then we said for counterflow now our delta T1 which is defined as the hot fluid temperature at the one position minus the cold fluid temperature at the one position in this case is now the hot inlet minus the cold outlet. So you can see one and two don't necessarily always correspond to inlet versus outlet. They just denote two different ends of the heat exchanger. And then similarly for delta T2 is the hot outlet minus the cold inlet. An interesting kind of result of the parallel versus counterflow configurations are if you have the same inlet and outlet temperatures for a parallel flow and a counterflow configuration, you can calculate the um, log mean temperature difference for both of them. And you actually see that the log mean temperature difference for a counterflow will always be higher than for a parallel flow. And so that means for the same values of the inlet and outlet temperatures and the um, like total thermal resistance, you'll get um, a higher heat transfer rate for a counterflow configuration than a parallel flow configuration. Or in other words, for the same heat transfer rate, the counterflow configuration requires a smaller surface area, so like a, a shorter length. So basically, it's more efficient. So for same inlet and outlet temps you can calculate these and show that the long beam temperature difference for counter flow is always larger than for parallel flow so this means for the same value of U. So U is the overall heat transfer coefficient. So remember the total thermal resistance equals one over U times A. So this is kind of just another expression of the total thermal resistance except without the area. So for the same value of U for uh, two different heat exchangers, the counterflow configuration requires a smaller surface area. To achieve the same Q. So basically, if the heat exchangers were identical in all other ways, you could get the same heat transfer rate with a smaller counterflow heat exchanger. And hopefully you will be able to see this in your lab. Yeah. I guess my question is, uh, if that's always true, then why would you ever use Why would you ever use flow? parallel flow? That's a good question. Um, I mean, the only... If, if the two inlets are already close to each other, then it's better to do that than like I was yeah I was gonna say I think the only other the only situation I can think of would be like just geometric constraints like layout or if the inlets are um, in like a manufacturing environment if they're like really close to each other and it'd be really expensive or require like a lot of pumping uh, power to, to take it somewhere else yeah okay so that's it for the summary of parallel flow and counter flow. And like I said, in your lab, you're going to run the heat exchanger in both of these setups and hopefully be able to see um, the difference in heat transfer rates between the two. So I want to talk now about um, 
how to calculate the convection coefficients for uh, heat exchanger analysis. So we have been talking about how we have an inner convection coefficient H and an outer convection coefficient on the two um, surfaces of the inner tube. And the inner convection coefficient is calculated using just kind of typical internal flow concepts that we're already used to. But the outer convection coefficient is on the outside of a tube, of a circular tube, um, kind of in a uh, geometric setup that we haven't really dealt with before. So it's like internal and external flow, like a little bit of a combination of the two. So we'll talk through how to do that. So let's draw out the um, heat exchanger that we're considering again. So we've got an inner tube of finite thickness. inner fluid and outer fluid, which could be either hot or cold. And then R sub 1 is the radius to the inner part of the inner tube and R sub 2 is the radius to the outer part of the inner tube. And then we said we typically call the convection coefficient on the inner side, H1 or HI, and on the outer side, H2 or HO. And typically when we talk about this coefficient, it is the average coefficient over the entire um, circular surface area of the inner part of the tube or the entire circular surface area of the outer part of the tube. And then we said our rate equation using the composite cylinder approach is the log mean temperature difference over the total thermal resistance. And then I'm going to write out the total thermal resistance expression one more time so we can take a look of piece by piece and see which parts of it we know and which parts of it we don't know and how we can determine each of the different um, thermal resistances. Okay, so typically the kind of information that you'll have when you start is some information about the geometry of the heat exchanger, the tube material, and if you're considering fouling, what the fouling factors are. So if we look through each um, separate resistance, if we know the geometry, we know the radius and the length, often, um, the fouling factors, the um, tube material, so we can look up the thermal conductivity of the tube, and then the only unknowns, or typically what we'll have to solve for, are the inner and outer convection coefficients. 
and these are going to be determined empirically. So let's start with the internal convection coefficient. That's the one that we're most familiar with. As we said, this will be determined from internal flow concepts. You can kind of think about these problems in um, sections. So if you just are thinking about the internal tube and the flow inside that tube, it's really just an internal flow problem. Typically, the internal flow will be turbulent. I haven't seen any problems where this isn't the case. The point of a heat exchanger is to exchange heat. So a turbulent flow has a higher convection coefficient. So if you can design your heat exchanger however you want, you will design it to have a turbulent internal flow so you have a better rate of heat transfer. So for the uh, internal flow or the internal convection coefficient, we'll use the familiar expression for turbulent flow with a small caveat. So all of the situations that we looked at in internal flow were either a um, constant surface temperature or a constant surface heat flux. But for the heat exchanger setup, we have a slightly more complicated um, boundary condition going on because we've got a constant, um, or we've got a surface temperature that's changing as heat is exchanged as you move in the x direction and the heat transfer rate is also changing as you're moving in the x direction. So that typically makes it challenging, if not impossible, to calculate this viscosity correction factor, the mu over mu sub s. So typically, we will neglect it for heat exchanger analysis. So let's talk a little bit about what this tells us and why it's okay to neglect it and why that, or when that might be questionable. So we've had this, the same correction factor has cropped up in the past, and we said that it basically accounts for the fact that if you have a fluid that has a um, highly variable viscosity with temperature, and you have a surface temperature that's significantly different from the mean temperature of your fluid, then the viscosity of the fluid will change quite a bit as you move radially from the middle of the tube, where the mean temperature is dominant, to the surface of the tube, where the surface temperature is dominant. So this is a correction factor for viscosity variation. And in laminar flow, we said we only need to tack this on if the fluid is a liquid. Because for gases, if you just flip to the back of your book and look through the values for air, water, and oil, you can see that the viscosity does not change very much with temperature for air. Changes somewhat significantly uh, for water and then very significantly for oil. 
And so we said, especially for oil, you need to include the viscosity variation. Um, but typically the problems with heat exchangers, we will neglect it because it's either unknown, we can't calculate it, it's a fluid that does not have a significant viscosity variation with temperature, or the um, temperature differences are not that significant. So this is especially true for the lab. The hot fluid and the cold fluid just aren't that different in temperature. The delta T is pretty small. So the mean fluid temperature and the surface of the wall are gonna be pretty close um, in temperature as well. So you're gonna have a pretty small viscosity variation. So when that's the case, this mu and mu sub s um, ratio is close to one. And if you raise it to the 0.14 power, you get a multiplication factor that's very close to one. So it does not change your Newsle number very much. Okay, so let's say we can neglect the viscosity correction factor. If the surface temperature is unknown, this is a good assumption if the fluid is a gas or The surface temperature and the mean fluid temperature are of a similar magnitude. Of course, how similar of a magnitude it depends on, and whether that delta T is significant depends on the specific fluid that you're talking about. This is usually an okay assumption for water and a bad assumption for oil. So even if you have to make this assumption and it's a pretty bad assumption, you at least know that it's a pretty bad assumption and that that's introducing some additional error into your uh, calculation. Okay, questions on the internal convection coefficient. Similar to what we've done before, except slightly simplified. Okay, the outer convection coefficient, this is what we haven't exactly seen before. And this will be calculated using the concentric tube annulus concept. Okay, this um, calculation involves a lookup table that's in the book. So I'm just going to show you what the book figure and table look like and then um, we can talk through it and I will also post this with the notes. So this is the figure. Basically this is what the annulus looks like. So it's a concentric tube and they're just assuming in this case that the inner tube is solid. Um, 
it doesn't really matter what's going on with the inner tube. And it gives you a method for calculating the convection coefficient on this surface, so the outer surface of the inner tube, and the convection coefficient on this surface, the inner surface of the outer tube. So we will typically care about the convection coefficient here. This will give us that H sub O that we've been talking about. Um, but in the lab, I ask you to think about how you could calculate the heat transfer with the environment. So typically we assume that it's perfectly insulated and there's no heat exchange with the surroundings. That's obviously an idealization. Um, so I ask you to think about how you could calculate the heat transfer with the surroundings as well. And so um, knowing that you can calculate this convection coefficient here from the annulus concept will be helpful for that. So again, confusing notation, but because this is coming from the annulus uh, concept, they have this labeled as uh, the Nusel number I, because for this it's inner, and this one is O, it's outer here. For the heat exchanger, this is H sub O. So I have that noted here, and I'll post this with the notes, but this in use of I corresponds to the convection coefficient typically labeled H sub O in heat exchanger analysis. Okay, so this is, um, this table of values is based on the laminar results that we went through for internal flow. Um, and I believe it's actually, that wasn't the kind of um, value that we got, the 3.66 or 4. Point something that were the constant values for fully developed laminar flow. Those were solved analytically. And I believe this table is just doing that performing that same solution analytically for this geometry. So it depends on the ratio of the inner and outer diameters. So um, to look up the uh, Nusel number, the corresponding Nusel number, first of all, you would have to verify that the flow is laminar. So this is only for a laminar result. For turbulent result, we'll use our same trusty empirical correlation that we use for the internal flow. For the laminar result, um, you would uh, basically look at the ratio of internal and external diameters, di over d sub o, find where that falls within this range, and then just linearly interpolate in the in use of i column. And that would give you the Nusel number. Um, the other exception, and we'll step through all this and write this down, is that this is calculated using the hydraulic diameter. So the diameter is defined as um, kind of like based on the wetted area. So it's the outer diameter minus the inner diameter. And that's the diameter that you use for calculating the Reynolds number um, and then calculating the convection coefficient for the annulus concept. Okay, you may also notice that this says, Nusel number for fully developed laminar flow in a circular tube annulus with one surface insulated and the other at a constant temperature. Some of these assumptions are a little questionable for what we'll be doing. So typically we assume that one of the surfaces, the outer surface is insulated and the other at, is at a constant temperature in time, but that's changing with space. Um, and then you will also, you're also neglecting the entry region using these correlations because it's only for fully developed laminar flow. So again, know that those are approximations that you're making. Okay, so let's write some of this down. So the Nusel numbers for a concentric tube annulus And here I'm using the notation corresponding to the table that we just looked at. <coughs> 
So the inner Neusel number corresponds to H sub O for heat exchanger notation. And you often, because we're, we assume that the outer surface is perfectly insulated, you often do not need to calculate this value for heat exchanger analysis. This D sub H is the hydraulic diameter. So that's D subscript H. Is the hydraulic diameter and it's the outer diameter minus the inner diameter. So if we're considering a thin walled inner tube it's just d sub o minus d sub i. But if you're thinking about a um, inner tube that has a thick wall, a substantial radius, then you have kind of the first radius that goes to the inner part, second radius to the outer part of that inner tube, and then third radius to the inner part of the outer tube. So in that case, the hydraulic diameter would be 2 times R3 minus 2 times R2. So you need to consider just the portion where the flow is. So if the flow is laminar, the flow in the annulus is laminar, it's still the same um, threshold where the Reynolds number less than 2300 is the laminar case. And then we have here the Reynolds number defined as the mean flow velocity times the hydraulic diameter over nu. So similar um, expressions for all the dimensionless parameters except everything is defined using the hydraulic diameter. So d sub h here. So if the flow is laminar, the Reynolds number calculated using the hydraulic diameter is less than 2300. <coughs> and the Neusel number is computed using table 8.2. And this is the kind of thing, if you needed to do this on an exam, I would provide the table for you. You don't need to write down the entire table in your equation sheet. And then just as a reminder, this in use of I corresponds to the outer convection coefficient. The temperatures don't matter. Is that? Oh, 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 oh. Um, for the viscosity, yeah. So this is again at the mean temperature of the relevant fluid. So if it's a hot fluid, it's the mean temperature of the hot fluid, cold, it's the mean temperature of the cold fluid. Yeah. So again, that's just calculated the same as it was for internal flow, the inlet, the average of the inlet and the outlet. Okay, questions on that? So that's what that's how we handle laminar flow of the outer fluid. <coughs> 
And then if the outer flow is turbulent, Reynolds number greater than 10,000, same as before. So for this, so for the concentric tube annulus case, um, if the flow is turbulent, you can assume that the Neusel number on the inner and outer surfaces are equal. And calculated from the internal flow correlation. So if it's turbulent, you use the same, if the inner and outer flows are both turbulent, you use the same expression for the Neusel number for both of them. So here, this would give you calculation of H sub naught. So the only difference would be because you're calculating the outer convection coefficient, again, you use the hydraulic diameter. and you may have to neglect viscosity ratio. Okay, questions on that? Okay, so there's one more concept that I wanted to go through, but I think first I'm gonna go through a problem. Wrote, I wrote up a problem solving methodology similar to what I did for internal flow. So I think I'm gonna go through that first, and then if there's time, we'll talk about the heat capacity rate concept, but that's not quite as important, I feel like, as talking about the, the problem solving. So. Okay, so I wrote up just kind of two generic example problems. So one for the case where you have a thin-walled inner tube and one where you have a thick-walled inner tube to show you the difference between the notation of the inner and outer diameters versus the radius one, two, and three, and how that um, gets handled in the hydraulic diameter and the Reynolds number calculations. Um, and for both of these problems, we're just solving for the heat exchanger length, L. And um, this is obviously not comprehensive, but kind of gives you a method for stepping through the calculations for these types of problems. Okay, so for the first problem, we're going to say we have um, a kind of ill-defined heat exchanger, but you either know, you will know if it's either parallel, parallel or counterflow, if the hot <coughs> fluid or the cold fluid is on the inner or outer tubes. You know the geometry, the inlet and outlet diameters, uh, or the inner and outer diameters and the inlet and outlet temperatures for both fluids, and the mass flow rates for both fluids. So this is standard to have most of this information, if not quite all of it. 
So the first um, step we would take, so we're trying to calculate the heat exchanger length that would give us these assigned inlet and outlet temperatures. So um, the only kind of variation of this problem or a, a possible variation of this problem is if you don't know one of the temperatures, um, then you can still calculate the heat transfer rate using the steady flow thermal energy equation and then that plugs into there and you can calculate the other temperature um, using this equation. So, okay, so we make our assumptions, neglect heat loss to the surroundings, connect potential energy changes, um, no phase changes of the fluid and constant properties. So those are our first basic assumptions that allow us to use the steady flow equation. Then um, once we do that, we can calculate the heat transfer rate using the steady flow equation. And that can be calculated either using the hot fluid or the cold fluid. They should be equal depending on what information is given. And then just like before, the values of the specific heat are evaluated at the average mean temperature of each fluid. So the CPH is evaluated at the average mean temperature of the hot fluid, CPC for the cold fluid. So then if the mass flow rates and the temperatures are known, that's all the information you need to calculate the heat transfer rate. And then once that's known, if you want to calculate the length of the heat exchanger, that is contained in this um, R total expression. So even though you know the heat transfer rate already, you have to use this alternative expression for Q to calculate the total length. So this is kind of showing our two different ways of calculating Q and they should be equal. Um, although this Q using this method is calculated empirically, so there will probably be some discrepancy between these. So the log mean temperature difference, if we know the inlet and outlet temperatures, we can calculate that. And I've written it out here for um, delta T LM and how it's defined for a parallel heat exchanger versus a counterflow heat exchanger. So that's kind of a, a known. So then the last unknown that we're left with is the uh, total thermal resistance. Because we know Q, calculated it up here. We know delta T LM if we know the inlet and outlet temperatures. So if we're neglecting conduction resistance and fouling, then this is going to be our expression for the total thermal resistance. So all we have is the convection, the inner convection um, resistance and the outer convection resistance on the inner and outer sides of the inner tube. And again, those are both defined using the inner diameter as the relevant area. So the big things we need to calculate still are the inner and outer convection coefficients. So the inner flow we said is typically turbulent and you use the um, turbulent internal flow expression. So this is very standard. We can neglect the viscosity ratio under certain circumstances. And then the Reynolds number is given um, just as before. So the mean fluid velocity of the inner flow times the inner diameter over nu. And again, fluid property is evaluated the average mean temperature of the inner fluid. And the mean velocity can be calculated from the mass flow rate if that's unknown. That's very standard. We've done that in all of our internal flow calculations mostly. And then the inner convection coefficient is just given like we're used to, the Nusselt number times the thermal conductivity over the inner diameter. And again, the thermal conductivity of the fluid evaluated the average mean temperature of the fluid of interest. And then outer convection coefficient, first you have to determine if it's laminar or turbulent. It's good to check if the inner flow is laminar or turbulent as well. It's typically turbulent, but you should check. Um, the Reynolds number now calculated using the hydraulic diameter. So we're talking about the outer fluid. It's a concentric annulus. And so you have to use the relevant diameter is the outer minus the inner diameters. And just like before, the mean velocity calculated from the mass flow rate and fluid properties at the average mean temperature now of the outer fluid. Okay. For laminar flow, the Nusselt number labeled here as subscript O for outer is determined from table 8.2. Due to a difference in notation, this corresponds to the inner Nusselt number for the concentric tube annulus. 
So the value in the table of n u sub i should be taken as n u d sub o. And then you can calculate the outer convection coefficient based on this Neusel number that comes from the table. And d sub h, again, is the hydraulic diameter. Um, and then if, oh, I forgot to add this part on here. I'll add this later. But if it's turbulent, like we said, it's just the same expression for the empirical correlation for turbulent flow. But I'll add that in to be comprehensive. So then everything except L is known. And then we can calculate, uh, rearrange this expression to solve for L. OK. It's quite a few steps involved. It's basically all of the things we've learned <laughs> up until now. Convection, calculating co uh, convection coefficients empirically, conduction, and composite uh, um, heat transfer. OK, I also wrote out a similar scenario. Um, but here you have a thick walled tube, and you have to include fouling. Um, and this was mostly just to show you kind of how the nomenclature changes. It's a very similar process stepping through. So the same kind of thing, calculating Q, delta T, log mean. But now our total involves the fouling and the conduction resistance. And so I've written everything here in terms of R1, R2, and R3, because inner and outer um, is a little ambiguous if you have, if you're considering the radius of the tube. So the inner convection coefficient um, sim calculated similarly. Here the Reynolds number is 2 times R sub 1. The diameter is 2 times R sub 1. So this is just the inner diameter. And then the big difference is here for calculating the outer convection coefficient. For the hydraulic diameter, it's 2 times R sub 3 minus 2 times R sub 2. So that kind of gives you the area where the fluid is actually flowing. So this is the hydraulic diameter if you're including the thickness of the wall. <coughs> and then the rest of the steps are similar. OK, so I'll add the turbulent case to both of these because it looks like I forgot to do that. But that's even easier. Use the same um, correlation as before. So if you all haven't signed up for a lab time yet, I haven't checked recently. Um, but last I checked, about nine groups had signed up out of 12. Um, do so. Tomorrow, Abby is going to go over some example problems, heat exchanger example problems, and then go through the lab. And we'll start the lab on Tuesday afternoon. OK, any questions? Yeah. I have a question on the analysis part. Sure. Do we, do we typically include in the hydraulic diameter the wall thickness of the inner tube? No. OK. Um, it's just because the, the hydraulic diameter is relevant to um, kind of what area is the fluid, what's the wetted area. So it's just going to be this part right here right. where the outer fluid is, is flowing. Okay. Yeah, so just the R3 minus R2. Right. Yeah. OK. <laughs>